So first, let's pick apart the title of this talk. What makes kids as a user group interesting and unique? Even more than adults, I argue that kids are really hands-on. They're physically expressive. They learn best by touching, feeling, interacting, and doing. So kids are going to need a much more direct interaction metaphor than adults, and that means that traditional keyboard and mouse interactions aren't necessarily well suited to this kind of hands-on interaction. Interestingly, children also expect the technology to mirror the physical world and vice versa. Their mental models don't necessarily separate technology from other objects the way that we adults do after experience teaches us that they don't work the same way. So the key is that this kind of relationship goes both ways. Here's an example um, of something like this going on in today's world. So I apologize for the quality of this video, but basically what you're seeing is a one-year-old child already experiencing the direct interaction world of the iPad and touching the screen makes things happen. And here she's trying to do the same gestures on a magazine. And she is using this plain print magazine. She's disappointed to realize that it doesn't work the same way. So kids are not really separating technology from non-technology objects. So we are going to need to be respecting that and um, when we're designing interactions for them. And we can also capitalize on it by using natural interaction metaphors. The quality kind of breaks down a little bit there towards the end. But there's that term, natural user interactions. What do I mean by natural? So broadly, the area that my work focuses on um, is non-keyboard, mouse-based alternative interaction modalities. And lately, these modalities have begun to be grouped under the label natural user interactions. And in natural user interactions, the focus is on allowing the user to communicate with the system using the same modalities that he or she would use to communicate with another person or with physical objects in the real world, such as touch, voice, vision, or motion. So the user can both receive output from the system in these modalities and deliver out, um, input to the system in those modalities. So my work has focused on touch and gesture. And I'll describe how my approach to designing interaction for these modalities can um, extend to others. And fundamentally, interaction is about providing the user with a path to realize their intent, to do their task, or to perform some action without the physical interface getting in the way. And natural user interactions become really important because they allow the user to focus on their task instead of the system. Because kids have different mental models than adults in how they're expecting the, to interact with the world, we need to start with natural interactions that fit to their conceptions, their expectations, and their abilities. Eventually, we can grow, we can adapt, and scaffold the kids' interactions um, to adult-suited interactions later if necessary. So sort of training them up to um, interact with quote-unquote grown-up systems. So these are broadly the topics I'll be touching on today. And I'm going to start with what motivates my research in this area and how I approach this problem and continue on to several example projects that um, are in this space. So first, I'm just going to overview my motivation and approach. I said I work with touch and gesture. Why should we be using touch and gesture for kids? A question that I often get asked when I'm talking about this work in terms of natural user interaction is whether gestures defined as drawing with pens or even fingers on surfaces are very natural. People usually accept that touch and pointing are fairly natural, but surface gestures can give them some pause. So I'm arguing here, based on some of these pictures as examples, the term natural user interaction really refers to interacting with digital technologies using um, abilities that we've honed through in non-digital contexts. And writing and drawing on surfaces is something humans have engaged in for thousands of years as a form of self-expression. And for kids especially, expressing themselves via uh, creating shapes on surfaces is a fundamental part of their development. And we could take advantage of this ability in creating our interfaces. So the key to natural user interaction is to ensure the user doesn't have to adapt to a new tool for each new digital device, but can use existing tools and abilities so they can focus on their task at hand. What's great for the future of touch and gesture natural interaction for kids is the current rampant spread of touchscreen devices, mobile or otherwise. So just some statistics for thought. 
Um, in, in up, in, by 2013, touchscreen sales are projected to reach 833 million devices. So that's 833 million unique touchscreens in the world, one for every eight men, women, or child. So just the iPhone 5 alone, you may know, sold five million units in its first weekend. And all of this just is to say that touch screens are here. I don't think they're going away. So we can really capitalize on this, mo this um, interaction platform for touch and gesture for kids. Data shows that kids are using mobile touch screen devices, either their own or their parents. But these devices haven't really been designed for them um, at a hardware or software level. And that might make you wonder, why does that matter? What makes using touchscreen devices hard for kids, especially if I'm already arguing that touch and gesture is more natural for them? I think the answer really lies with the interactions required with current touchscreen devices. So studies are showing that kids already have trouble with touch interaction. These are just some prior uh, studies from the literature indicating that um, kids are having difficulty doing things like um, performing gestures based on limitations in their manual dexterity and shape creation skills. Um, they're having difficulty with unintended or unexpected touches or interactions uh, due to fine motor control limitation. And all of these are affecting kids' inter ability to interact with touch input technology for successful, uh, to be successful. And what we really need to do is understand what all of these relevant factors are and how they're inter impacting interaction in different contexts so that we can take advantage of uh, that understanding to design better interactions. So many of the interaction challenges that I mentioned make it difficult for the device or to interpret the touch events that are being sensed by the device. So that is, it's hard to understand what the child meant to do. D if the child has difficulty with drag and drop or touching on-screen targets or making certain gestures, we don't know what they were intending to accomplish. So what we need to do is build and design systems and algorithms that can understand this target user characteristics better to successfully capture the intent. And for example, special purpose recognizers for children might need to be developed, or different error recovery strategies um, may need to be designed. So foreshadowing a bit of my own work that I'll talk about in more detail uh, in this talk, here are some examples of adults drawn shapes and the same shapes drawn by children ages 7 to 11 years old. So recognition technology that's been trained on the expected smooth and orderly input that's usually provided by adults are, will fail miserably when they're confronted by these kids' examples. So back to the title of this talk, Understanding, Designing, Developing, Natural User Interactions for Kids. How do I approach solving this problem, especially in the area of touch and gesture? As the title suggests, I focus on three main aspects to every research project that I um, undertake. So understanding, I'm underst I focus on studying um, users' behavior in their native environments. The MAGIC project is a good example of this, and I'll talk about it in more detail in this talk. And what you'll see is that we can identify ways that kids make gestures and touch targets differently than adults in a reliable way that we can use to design for and increase their su success of the children using those interactions. Second, designing things. Um, the focus on designing appropriate interaction is important, um, an important element of HCI. So I have experience in user-centered design processes that can enable interactive systems to take user needs and characteristics into account based on what we learn in the first phase. And a good example project of this is the Maze project, which I did as part as my dissertation work at Carnegie Mellon. And what you'll see in this project is that we can design for the application context in a way that reduces the negative impact of any recognition errors that we might have while um, engaging in interaction with some of these interpretive um, modalities. And the third phase is developing, so building things. Um, design really does go hand in hand with development in my research. Advancing the technical state of the art is part of what I'm trying to achieve and we're doing that in ways that makes the user-centered design feasible. So we, w we have things that we know the users want to do, how can we improve the technology to the level that can enable that to happen. Um, a good example of this type of project is the N dollar and P dollar uh, recognizers. And what you'll see in this project is that um, we can develop robust multi-stroke recognition 
that can be easy and fast for trying out gesture um, interactions for new prototypes and, see, and seeing what we can provide for new users in new contexts. And throughout these three phases, I'm constantly evaluating with real users, iterating over each phase until I find solutions that can provide real world benefits. Um, coming at this work from a human-computer interaction perspective, and I've talked about these three phases, understanding, designing, and developing, and how they um, interact to um, form the basic pillars of my research. The, so my training in HCI enables me to study users' relationships with technology, design and develop natural interaction technologies, and evaluate the success of those interactions. So now let's walk through some of the main findings in these areas um, with respect to understanding children's expectations and abilities and designing and developing for them. So first, the MAGIC project. MAGIC is mobile touch and gesture interaction for children. And for those following along, the T is silent. This project is currently NSF funded. And we have a pretty big team right now, which is really nice because we have a lot of students excited about this area. We can tackle many different um, different pieces at once. The MAGIC specifically is looking at touch and gesture on mobile devices like smartphones and tablets because they're the most common type of, type of touch screen device that children do have access to these days. So the MAGIC project is following the same three-pronged research approach that I've been outlining up till now, understanding, designing, and developing. Currently, we're in the understanding phase. What we want to do is understand differences between kids and adults in this in these modalities of touch and gesture input, and no one has really been answering these questions at a fundamental level yet. So how can we um, understand the expected input from kids so that we can design and develop for those, uh, for those expected inputs? So far, we've run three studies. The third one is currently ongoing. Um, looking at two, we're looking at two touchscreen tasks right now, um, one touch interaction and one focus on gesture, and I'll talk about those more in detail in a second. But our first steps are really focusing on the atomic, basic atomic interaction. So we're isolating the input behaviors from any effects uh, of the user's context or the task. And we're currently working with five to seven year olds this fall to kind of um, expand out the age range of kids that we've been looking at. So these are the two ta tasks that we're looking at in, this, in our set of studies. The first one on the top is the touch task. Um, these are just blank screen interfaces that, you s that we'll see on the phones that the, the people are doing in our studies. And what, you th what they have is this black box. It's a target. They're supposed to touch it. When they touch it successfully, it moves on to the next target. Um, the targets vary in their size and shape. Um, not their shape, all squares. Their, their size and location. And some of them, which is probably a tiny bit hard to see, but in the second picture, is slightly inset from the screen size, screen edge. So most of the, half of them are flush with the screen and half of them are slightly inset. And we did this just to explore different play ways to lay out interactors on screens based on doing some surveys of different apps that are out there today. Um, the second task is the gesture task. And in this task, the users are drawing gestures that are shown here on the right with their finger. And we're taking a pretty liberal um, definition, a broader definition of gesture, just any kind of shape that might be um, used to interact with a, an, a system, a mobile app. And a lot of these are you currently use today, like for example, gesture search. You might um, be able to write a letter, and it will jump to that area of your contacts list and things like that. And in half the cases, the kids um, experience the gesture task where they see a trace of their finger's path as they are doing the task. And in the other half, they don't see the trace. And we just did this to understand different ways that we see, them out, see these being used out in the apps in the real world and how do they actually translate to input from the users. So moving to findings, what we've been seeing so far are some really interesting results that kind of have been holding up through the different studies. The first focuses on the touch. The first that I'm going to focus on is in the touch task area. So what we see is children tend to miss targets a lot more often than adults. We also find that the targets, the smallest targets, are the most challenging. So in this touch cloud that appears up here on the right, the um, red squares are children's touches, and blue squares are adults' touches, and the black box is the outline of the target. So 
as we um, are collecting the input data from the system, the we see these sort of touch clouds. They're dispersed around the target. Some of them are outside the target bounds, and those would count as misses. And with kids, we find that the um, the dispersion pattern is a little bit broader. They tend to miss by more. The adults are tighter if they miss at all. Um, what we also see is that the edge padded targets are more challenging for both kids and adults. So in the, in the edge padded cases, the ones that are slightly set in from the screen edge, we actually see the miss rate doubles and 99% of the misses occur in that gutter space between the edge of the screen that's touch sensitive and the target. Um, and so this is a really interesting set of findings that we've t taken. Um, they're all statistically significant in terms of showing ch kids have more difficulty with than adults. And what we've done is taken them and expanded them out into design recommendations that we can, y we can use then in our third phase of our project to actually design testbed apps. So the first you know, couple ones focus on if kids are missing targets more often than adults, maybe what we can do is take advantage of that touch cloud, use some probabilistic reasoning to figure out what um, target the child meant to touch, and increase the area that activates the desired target so that we can count some close misses as actual hits and kind of help them through uh, that, that phase of the, you know, their interactions. And smallest targets are most challenging, so we can see, we can follow the recommendations we have in our paper um, for target size based on the range that we tested that was based on platform specifications as well as uh, just apps and things we saw out in the real world. And then for edge padded targets, this is something that we, we weren't expecting to find necessarily because you know it's sort of related to Fitt's law. We didn't necessarily think that we were going to see that on a mobile device because the screen set real estate is so much smaller. You don't really path through a, f um, a uh, path to get to the target. But Fitt's law, um, for those who aren't familiar on the desktop, just defines a relationship between the target, the time to acquire the target, and the size of the target and the distance you have to travel. And a, a sort of consequence of that is that if you have a target on the edge of the screen um, and the sensing device allows you to move beyond that edge virtually but not um, physically but not virtually then you can have effectively an infinite size target. So what we see is that a similar um, rule is holding here on the m mobile devices and we would recommend then that people actually s still align their targets with the edge of the screen or at least allow that gutter to be active. Yes, Marilyn? Did you do a fits all model where you made the target infinite? And on most cases where they missed, did, they, uh, did it match the model better? No, we haven't done that step yet. I'm hoping to get a student who might be interested in looking at it at that level. And I'd really like to actually establish that contrast. It, it holds up as well. It, it strikes me that fits all might start to explain some of the things you're getting. Exactly. Um, some of the stuff might be a larger constant, and you would look at that. Yes. Um, especially the spread. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, we probably didn't collect time, so. Um, we, we did collect time. It's, it might be a, there might be some situations where you'd have to finagle the data a little to get the true time. But yeah, there is time stamped in the data. You don't have to start from the same direction. That's true. And you don't have that we don't have that. Data. So potentially, we could do a follow-up study where we have them return to the home position and then go to the targets. And we've thought about that anyway because of the um, issues with, um, which I'm going to talk about next, which is this phenomenon called holdovers, which, we've, which we saw in our study. We've actually seen this, and you may have experienced this in your own use of mobile devices or any technology, where you sort of click the button, it doesn't respond right away, so you hit it again, and by the time you know it catches up to you, it's done and undone what you did. So what we saw was that this actually happened in our mobile study as well. And um, these touches in the location of the previous target, so we have the target um, on the left, and then there's a bunch of touches there. Once people are successful, it moves on to the screen on the right, and then we see some of these leftover touches they're, they're calling holdovers. And so what we see is that 96% of all holdovers are done by the, the children in the study, and 81% of the holdovers are for the smallest targets. So 
most of the time with the small targets, the kids are having a different strategy um, than the adults, and they're, t they're tending to generate a few more touch events that once the screen has moved on, are going to cause unintended interactions for them if this was a real app. So what we're doing is we're digging into this a little bit more to try to understand the relationship between that, um, where the target is and the size and, and children and whatnot versus adults. Um, and one of the things we've talked about is having a slightly different approach where there's a center part of the screen, like something that goes in between the targets. The thing is this, you know, we want to control the um, situation to make it kind of similar to a, as similar to real interactions as possible without adding context, at least for this stage, because we want to see, you know, when you hit that target, you may still hit it again, like an on-screen menu or something, and how can we take, in, take that into account? So once we can understand the relationship that cause it, that's causing holdover, something that kind of emerges from this is the idea of ignoring any touches that might occur in the area of the previously active target, let's say with some time threshold. So if you have two really rapid touches in a, on an interactor that, should, that doesn't expect double tapping, then maybe you would ignore the second one so we wouldn't have that sort of event cue that um, undoes their interaction from before. So those are just some of the types of things that we've seen on the touch target task. We do see adults doing this, but interestingly a lot fewer. Um, so 96% of these occurrences were kids, so only 4% were adults. So it's interesting, we're trying to dig into why this happens, especially since uh, this have noticed this happening on their own phones and wonder sort of what is it that's causing it to be so less, so much less prevalent for adults. Because they're Kids are probably less patient than adults. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Impatient adults. Impatient adults. I should do that. Yeah. I that. Could recommend <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. When we hypothesize there could be just a cognitive delay, a processing delay, or the kids don't care, like you're saying, they're impatient, or they're just like not, sh they're not. Noticing, they're really focused, so they didn't notice it moved, and then they notice it just takes them a half a beat longer than adults. But we're trying to dig into some of these factors in more detail to really understand why. I think this is based on the first study and this one both. Um, how long does it take to acquire that skill? The, the skills that you're showing that the kids may have, because it's so subjective game, especially for the playing task. Right. Right. We haven't looked at learning um, these skills, so we've done just purely one session study so far. And what I would like to do within the next year is do something that's over several sessions. Because most of the kids that actually came into our study um, were kids that had exposure to smartphones. Look at kids without exposure to smartphones. But at least for these kids, we don't necessarily think that it's complete novelty that is causing them to have these behaviors because they are familiar with the concept of touching and interact. So I think there's sort of maybe a complex interplay of factors that we're trying to sort of tease apart um, over the course of this next year. So moving on to the gesture task, what we see here is um, that we can we find evidence that children are actually making gestures differently than adults in reliable ways. So they tend to make big, bigger gestures. They tend to make gestures that have more strokes. So they lift up their finger and put it down again much more often than adults for the same gestures. And what we see for this is that this is actually inter interfering with how well the gestures can be recognized. Because with modern recognizers, they're either trained on adults um, or they're trained in certain ways to expect input that, that is sort of in an orderly and consistent manner. And what we, even if we um, train recognizers on kids' gestures, they still have much lower recognition for the kids than the adults. And we see an actual positively str a strong correlation with age. So as you, if you take an older person and feed their, their data into the recognizer, the recognition is, is higher. So it's sort of an interesting relationship there. And what we see, what we think that this means is that we're going to either need to train on kids' gestures that may be a lower level of detail. So we're training on sort of you know, rough age groups, you know, 
uh, middle school, elementary school, high school kind of things. Maybe we need to be even more specific and say this is the nine-year-old recognizer, this is the eight-year-old recognizer. Because especially in those earlier years, they're experiencing um, leaps and bounds of manual dexterity improvement as they're learning handwriting or penmanship in school um, and drawing and things like that. The second option is to develop tailored uh, specialized recognizers that are looking for these types of features um, differently than the uh, ones that have been trained and developed for adults. So those are some um, areas that are actually specifically of interest to me and I would like to be working on those like by the end of uh, the magic project really focusing um, on that as a sub piece of the project. So the bottom line for magic is that you know when kids make gestures they touch targets differently than adults we can design for this and um, we think there's clear evidence that, that these things really do matter in interaction and must be taken into account. And what we want to do next is um, to collect more data on different age groups. I talked a little bit about younger kids, even younger than school age kids. I talked about um, younger than, uh, sorry, kids that are not as familiar with technology and how does that make a difference. And the second thing we want to do is look at in-context apps. So we've been looking only at apps where the target, where the task is just to make input. But what, how does that input change, or does it, when you have a layer uh, of context on top of it that you know this now the child's focus is on something different, not just touch this target, but they're immersed in a sort of a context um, motivation, and it, it, you know, intrinsically from the app. So this is just an example. It's not our app, but it's something we're modeling after. It's a patty cake app on the iPad where the giraffe puts up his her paws and you're supposed to tap with the paw and then it's a similar kind of thing to our target app but you can see with the layer of context. We can collect similar data if we make this app, make an app like this and instrument it. I also co designing with kids, so actually designing some of these interactions, designing error recovery, so if we didn't understand your gesture, how can we recover from that and how can we engage kids in designing those um, cases? And like I said, long term, I'm looking at designing tailored recognizers for kids. So on the magic project, we're going to be looking at how interaction changes in certain contexts. And I've already done some work um, on taking advantage of context to improve interaction in my dissertation work on pen input for an algebra tutor, or the MAZE project. So MAZE is multimodal algebra equation, equation solving. And it was done, the bulk of my dissertation work at Carnegie Mellon, um, and was funded through the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center that was joined between CMU and University of Pittsburgh. So the PSLC really focused on projects that are funded relating to educational technology or learning sciences. So in my first couple of years in grad school, I worked on a project involving getting students more actively engaged during math tutoring which led me to wonder about other possible ways of doing that. The intelligent tutoring systems that were being used for math at the time heavily relied on keyboard and mouse use, for example, to solve algebra equations. Teachers told us that students had, uh, working in this tutor with the keyboard and mouse, had difficulty um, transferring their skills to paper situations for tests and solving problems on their own. And in learning environments, naturalness of the interaction is it's really even more important than in other domains because there's a risk that interface complexities can actually interfere with learning. So for my thesis, I hypothesized that integrating pen input into the algebra tutor would increase the naturalness of the interface. And at that time, no one yet knew how we could make recognizers work for kids since recognizers would truly be imperfect and people thought, well, I don't want to spend you know, the time with the kids running down a rabbit hole, correcting the recognizer. And so one of the goals of my thesis was to explore that and how we could avoid that kind of situation. So the project also included all three phases I've been talking about um, in designing, understanding, designing, and developing. But what I'm going to focus on, the main contribution of this piece for today's talk, is the designing, I interaction design aspect. And I focused on investigating how the context from the tutor could help recognition. So through a series of three classroom and laboratory studies, I developed a prototype algebra tutoring system that allowed students to solve equations with handwriting input. And the prototype that I built for my dissertation integrated two pre-existing components. First, we had the cognitive tutor. It's a family of learning um, 
a family of intelligent tutoring systems from Carnegie Learning. And what makes it unique is that it keeps an internal model of the student. It helps it predict how well the student will do on a particular set of problems. And it, so it is able to use that model to assign new problems to the student and, um, and keep track of the student's mastery of the skills that they're supposed to be learning in this lesson. So I used the math curriculum, specifically a lesson on algebra equation solving. And secondly, the component that I uh, integrated to actually recognize the handwriting um, of the math was called Freehand Formula Entry System. It provided the character recognizer and a math expression parser. So I had surveyed several handwriting recognizers that were available at the time, and FFES had the highest accuracy on the 16,000 math samples, um, samples of math writing that we had collected from students through our earlier studies. So these two, these two components were integrated by me to enable a handwriting input panel and the cognitive tutor to actually accept handwriting input and receive back a, mar a pa parsed math result for the cognitive tutor to score the student's answer. And this is just a screenshot of how the prototype was used to allow pen input. So the design of the system used three strategies to make a recognition-based interface work for kids. I'm going to describe each one briefly. So first I trained the FFES recognizer, the freehand formula entry system, on samples of writing from the target users. So we had um, 40 middle and high school students participated in our earlier studies. They were solving algebra equations. We hand segmented and labeled all the math that they entered in order to train the recognizer on um, samples of real input from kids of the target age group. Second, we use the context from the cognitive tutor itself, the student model I was talking about, to improve recognition. So we were able to use information about what skills that student has to predict what, how, what the likelihood that they're going to get the right answer is. As it also knows, the, pro the tutor also knows what problem the student is solving and what are the possible bugs, the options that different kids have, commonly have and that we might see in the output and that might recognize their um, hypothesis. So by combining all this information with FFES, we were able to let the handwriting recognizer to prune its search space and do um, a better job recognizing the input from the student. So I used a technique from collaborative information retrieval to merge the two end best list. What we get from the recognizer is a hypothesis um, ranked in order of confidence of what the student wrote, and we, get, we can do the same. We can transform the tutor's information into the same kind of thing, and then we can combine them, um, improve the output in the end from yielding an improved recognition hypothesis. And what we did, what, what we found was the net benefit on accuracy of a priori training that I mentioned, um, doing this average rank sort by using the tutor's knowledge, actually um, improved recognition accuracy by 10% or 10 percentage points or an 18% improvement. So we think with better base recognizers, the same approach could yield much um, similar results, but better, you know, we start, if we can start from a better baseline, we can improve similarly with real world gesture input. We, um, uh, you know, we were not off task writing and we didn't get involved in that, in, at least in the scope for my dissertation, but that's always a problem. There are some sketch recognition approaches that you could use to at least detect when that was happening and maybe intervene or kind of pop up a warning for the teacher to kind of take a look at that student's work and see, you know, get them back on task. But in terms of what we were doing, what I was doing, no, I didn't focus on in those cases. So the third design to decrease the impact of recognition errors on the student's experience involved redesigning the tutor interaction called task pragmatics. So what I mean by that is we based, based on the expectation that at least some recognition errors will occur, we'll never have 100% accuracy, then in cases where the system must involve the student in recognition error recovery, you know, the system really needs to know in order to provide effective tutoring, the system needs to know accurately what the student was writing. 
What we do is focus the interaction on identifying the student's first problem solving error in order to keep the focus on tutoring. So we never say, here is my recognition approach, or here's my recognition hypothesis, is that, is that correct? And, and, and can you correct this for me and do all this stuff? We kind of abstract that and focus it um, on identifying the student's error. So we altered the pedagogical intervention, the one that focuses the, the way that the tutor actually was providing instruction to avoid recognition of a problem until after the student had generated the complete solution, increasing the amount of the information we had available to the tutor and the recognizer so we could be more confident about uh, the recognition hypotheses. And we, I also designed an interaction paradigm that minimizes the impact on the student of recognition errors by avoiding directly requesting the student to correct the system's errors, as I was mentioning. Our recent IJHCS article describes this paradigm in a lot more detail than I can talk about here, but the, here's one example of a screenshot of how such a tutor could work. After the whole problem is written out, the student types the final answer, and if we do this because typing the final answer is relatively simple, we're talking about a number or two, then we have, um, confident res um, we have confidence that we need to intervene because the answer is wrong. If the answer is wrong, the tutor tries to recognize the problem solution with the goal of identifying where the student first made an error. So the tutor asks the student to verify what they intended to write for that step and can launch tutoring if this verification occurs. So the paper talks a little bit about alternative ways to do this prompt that's not, that, are not, um, that are a little more sophisticated. And I just want to point out that this is one example of how it could work, but the paradigm talks about a lot of different options. And so the several studies that I conducted as part of my dissertation did find that this tutoring paradigm was successful for kids learning math on the computer. Because of the natural support handwriting input has for 2D math notations, like fractions or exponents, it was easier for students to use pen input to enter them than using typing interfaces. And the transparency of the pen interaction led students to experience improved transfer of their skills to paper-based situations. And students were also more engaged during use of the pen input tutor. They were twice as fast as students using the uh, traditional tutor with keyboard and mouse input. And um, they, but they learned just as much. So pre-test to post-test showed this similar gains, um, but they did it in half the time. After using both modalities for math input in a separate part of these studies, we also found that students tended to prefer math input. Uh, pen input for math over typing um, using a Likert scale. So we think that these sort of show that the prototype is successful and we can use the same paradigm in to um, design other types of situations where we, we want to use context to reduce the negative impact of these um, recognition errors on children's learning interactions. So although the tutor prototype itself is shelved right now, I think that knowledge from this project can specifically be used in uh, future work. So for example, using some of this knowledge to inform the magic project when we're actually designing our proof of concept apps and we're going to be recognizing gestures, this is part of where we see the co-design with kids coming in to um, help use them as, in, as creative sources of ideas for how to avoid getting them involved in recognition errors while uh, recovery. While the piece is potentially considering task pragmatics when we're designing a new context. So understanding when can we sort of, sort of like flip the interaction. So, you know, where the, we're focusing on the, the, the user's task rather than on um, the system's recognition and, and sort of flipping it so the user can stay focused on their task. And in the long term, I do think that I'd be interested, I'm, I am interested in getting back into educational environments and taking, um, building up from the magic project, so it just really starts at a fundamental level and then and bringing the whole cycle uh, full circle to back into a learning environment for classroom use. All right, so, um, now we know about input from kids. We know about designing for kids. How can we make a good baseline recognizer for kids? I talked a little bit about tailored recognizers, so what can we do to um, address that? We did okay with the maze project where we used FFES, but I thought we could do better. And I have the perfect recognizers in mind, N dollar and P dollar. 
And I just want to check quickly on time because I wasn't sure if you wanted me to stop um, before one yeah, or go, go one. to one. Okay. So N dollar and P dollar are projects I've been working on to improve fundamental algorithms for pen and gesture finger pen and finger gesture recognition. I have two great collaborators on this project, Jake Wobrock at University of Washington and Radu Vitav at the University of Stefan Salmari, which is in Romania. And what we've been working on is we call dollar recognizers. So these are a family of recognized gesture recognition algorithms that are simple, fast, accurate, multi-stroke recognizers. Do N dollar was first when I needed a recognizer for maze. You know, we already were working with FFBS, but it really needed a lot of training examples, um, and we wondered if we could find something better. I think when we were training FFBS for my dissertation, we needed 40 examples of every character, uh, every, you know, number, letter, symbol that we wanted to recognize. And that wasn't really um, feasible for rapid prototyping or other situations where you might not have time to train, you know, take classroom time to train. Uh, for each individual kid's writing. So we wondered if we could find something better. Jake had a Unistroke recognizer called $1. It didn't need many training examples. It was pretty accurate, but it could only accept gestures that were made with one stroke. So you only, um, from one pen down to pen up, and that was it, and you couldn't do like an X or any other thing where you wanted to lift up your pen and call it part of the same symbol. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of gesture types that need more than one stroke letters, shapes, numbers, and limiting to Unistroke really limits the types of situations you could use this. So we, um, I built N dollar on top of one dollar using a simple modification I'll just talk about in a minute. And with this modification, N dollar was able to recognize those multi-stroke symbols um, without sacrificing a lot of accuracy. So N dollar makes it easier to try different approaches when doing recognition um, for different situations and for tailored recognition. Uh, P dollar is the newest member of the dollar family, and I'll discuss that shortly. But an overarching goal of the dollar family in general is to make gesture prototyping easier and more accessible. To that end, the dollar family is a big shift in um, paradigm from to prior work in this area. We use clever representations of the gesture data to recognize gestures without requiring a lot of expertise in machine learning or pattern matching and or having lots and lots of training examples. And one cool anecdote that I think shows the success of, you know, our success in actually doing this is that a hobbyist programmer actually used N dollar. He ported it to um, the Apple platform and used it in a, an application to help his little girl practice her numbers. So she was drawing numbers and he was recognizing them as a way to give her some practice. And I thought that's exactly the kind of thing we're trying to do with today's, um, you know, the platforms being really widespread. We really want to, um, and the barriers to entry being lower of having these, you know, these types of technology in your apps, we really want to have that be the case. So we're, we're making sure all of our, our pseudocodes online, we have reference implementations, everything's open source, things like that. So like $1, N dollar uses template matching to recognize gestures. And in template matching, we call the stored examples templates, and the gestures you're trying to recognize are called candidates. So you need at least one example of each type of gesture to um, store it as templates for dollar family recognizers. And you can with just one. Uh, it depends on how many you have, how many different types of gestures you want to just recognize, and how similar they are. So you, the figure shows that how after we resample the gestures, these used to be threes, we normalize them, resample them, and align them up to be as similar as possible. We then match pairs of points consecutively. The match score of two gestures is just computed as the sum of the distances between these pairs of points in the two gestures. And this, the template overall with the lowest score overall is then returned as the recognition result. So $1 recognized gestures with just that one step. And as I mentioned, N dollar extended $1 to recognize multi-strokes using a simple modification. It does this by representing multi-strokes as connected uni-strokes. We count the pen up periods. So think about it. When you're writing or drawing any kind of gesture, you, 
your arm, as you get to the bottom of a stroke and you lift it and you put it back down and drag it again across the surface, your arm is moving through that air space in the air. So we are just including it in the gesture as a simplification of representation. So if you look at the X shown on the right, users could write this gesture in any one of these eight, um, any one of these eight orders, directions or orders. I think I said right, but I meant left. Um, and then n dollar is going to represent them all internally. Those are the things. Those are the versions on the right. And they're going to be internally represented. The user will never see these, but it's just a way for the n dollar n dollar to be robust then to all these different stroke orders and directions. The user only has to enter one of them, and they're all they're all handled and supported. So for something like an X, there may actually be a most common order for the way people write uh, letters. But for symbols like squares or triangles, it's much less consistent. So actually representing all of these orderings is helpful. A number of data sets so far. One's a corpus collected in the laboratory of multi-stroke symbols for user interface prototyping. And another is the same real world algebra corpus that we had collected during my dissertation work that I mentioned before. So we have found n dollar is highly accurate. It's comparable to one dollar, ninety-seven to ninety-eight percent on these domains, which makes it very easy to use for prototyping without recognition errors, decreasing the transparency of the user's experience. The algebra corpus from Maze was more challenging. It needed more training examples per gesture type to get similar accuracy, and this is most likely due to the variability in kids' real-world compared adult compliant gestures that we collected in the lab. And so these are, this is something that we're actively seeking to improve. How can we um, improve accuracy without needing so many training examples, even for kids? OK, so n dollar works really well. It can pro robustly recognize multi-stroke gestures drawn in any stroke num um, order or direction based on even just one example. But n dollar can become slow as the number of stored templates increases and the number of strokes in your gestures increases. Because we're storing all those, yes, yeah, sorry? Oh, I just, my, my husband, I actually live in Taiwan. And oh. I'm just wondering, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm just wondering what the difference is. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I was surprised at how good it was. I mean, that I could draw something that didn't look much like right. a real, you know, traditional Chinese character, and it would. I mean, then I just uh, choose it or whatever. But right. Is that the same. Is the same idea. It is the same idea. Um, one of the things that you can do for n dollar is you can um, use a heuristic to circumvent the per permutation. So you don't have to actually store all those different options if there is, in fact, one correct option. And I get this question a lot from people who know Chinese or Japanese, and there actually is an important um, ordering of those the character and the language. So in that case, we would, you would be able to do a simple modification to n dollar to uh, just shortcut those permutations being stored and do it directly. Right. So something that you know you could do with that would be to a little maybe a little app on your phone to sort of tutor you, or you can practice doing your stroke ordering, and n dollar can say, you know, n dollar could be used to do the recognition and then give you some uh, intervention to remind you of the correct order if you do it incorrectly. So what we see, so going back to the slide, is what we see that as the number of per strokes in the gesture increases, that increases the number of permutations that we have to store internally, those little x's I was talking about. So um, it w what we, up to about four or five strokes, this is not you know, necessarily a performance challenge, and it's not much of a limit if we're only talking about alphabetic characters or simple shapes. 
But if we want to rec represent something like a cube that has up to nine strokes, we would need 185 million internal permutations. That's really infeasible for n dollar. It can't even it can't run that on a you know today's desktops, let alone the mobile devices with limited resources. So what we did, um, what we started investigating ways to uh, address this issue, and in a recent ICMI paper, which um, we presented at in LA a few weeks ago, we introduced the P dollar recognizer. And this addresses the permutation problem of n dollar. So what we do is we're just forgetting the strokes. We're not going to take into account which order and direction the users wrote the, sim the points in. We're just going to treat it as a set of point, cl a point cloud. Um, we can abstract all the ways gestures can be made. We can ex abstract the execution details, such as the number of strokes, the stroke order, and the direction. And even this simple square can be drawn using one, two, three, or four strokes. They can vary in order and direction. There's a total of 442 possibilities that n dollar would have had to represent, but p dollar can just use that point cloud there on the end. So if you're interested in how we developed the p dollar algorithm, we describe how it evolved in the paper. The key point is that the time-free point matching from a candidate gesture to the template is an assignment problem, which has a solution in graph theory, and we have a um, the Hungarian algorithm is the ideal, and we have developed an approximation that is in the same dollar family vein, where it uses simple geometrical principles and math that anyone can kind of throw together, very few lines of pseudocode, um, in order to get your the recognition of, you know, in your app. I'm going to skip the demo of how it works, but you can ask me after if you're interested in seeing a little animation of how it matches the points. And so in the meantime, we evaluated P dollar on the same gesture set corpus as we did for N dollar, and we found that P dollar achieves extremely high accuracies with reasonable training example requirements, um, much fewer, a little bit fewer at least than N dollar. So we don't need to collect as many examples from our users before we can throw the application together. The paper includes a lot more details on P dollar. Uh, such that it outperforms N dollar, it matches the optimal version and all that stuff. Um, no matter what the number of training examples that you have, the participants, the number of participants that you have, or the sampling rate. So now, with P dollar, we can accurately recognize both unistroke and multistroke gestures, no matter how they're actually drawn. I'm going to skip that slide. And since we're targeting support for user interface and rapid developers and rapid prototypers, who might be working on new platforms. We emphasize the open source approach that I mentioned. Implementations of $1 and N dollar are already available in many languages. We provide pseudocode uh, for each member of the dollar family to enable it to be picked up um, and port to new platforms. And so P dollar only has 70 lines of pseudocode, so we think that we can, we'll, we'll see some more pickup as we have for $1 and N dollar already. And the dollar family can achieve this degree of accessibility to non-experts because of its simplicity. As I mentioned before, you don't have to be an expert in machine learning to uh, recognize a few simple gestures for your apps. So I'm not going to go into this table in detail, but I just want to point out that it's in the ICMI paper. It weights uh, different factors that you might be considering when trying to decide which algorithm is the right one for your app and helps you pick the one, the one of the dollar family to implement. So in summary, what do we now know about recognizing gestures? The bottom line for the dollar family, at least so far, that's relevant to this talk, is that we're now able to provide multi-stroke recognition that's robust to a certain level of execution detail, that is stroke number, stroke order, and direction. And we think that this might actually be really helpful for kids, because as I talked about in the earlier phase of the talk, we see that they actually use different numbers of strokes. They do things very inconsistently compared to adults. And, if, and perhaps P dollar will be the right approach for them. So N dollar was tested on uh, kids' handwriting, and it did OK. And what we're currently working on is testing P dollar on kids' handwriting. And so I'll have some results for that, hopefully, um, within the next few weeks. And we'll you know, talk about whether how good it is. P dollar still needs P dollar on the horizon. So in the future, I do see an optimized N dollar being useful in these ways. So we can evaluate P dollar on kids' gestures, and perhaps 
developing tailored recognizers. Um, and what I'd really love to do is expand to all other input modalities and maybe try out these types of recognition approaches on mid-air gestures, like on the Connect or uh, different virtual environments. Okay, so those are my three main projects. I'll just wrap up pretty quickly here, focusing on natural user interaction for kids. Um, I talked about my user-centered HCI approach, understanding, designing, and developing with lots of evaluation and iteration. And I argued that natural user interaction for kids makes sense because, at least in part, because children tend to expect technology to mirror the real world and vice versa. So I've presented these three projects, and, um, as, and I plan to, in the future, continuing to investigate these areas with a goal to understand kids' expectations and abilities and design and develop interaction and support them. That wraps up my talk, so I'll have you to take any more questions. Thanks. <laughs> Do you ultimately see the development of kid-specific technology, like a kid smartphone, mm -hmm. or a kid iPad? Right. We already have that, but but I know we have versions. Of it, but I think mm hmm. We do have, like, there's uh, the LeapFrog tablet, which is basically a tablet, <coughs> excuse me, for kids with big, um, uh, has a green case and it has, you know, big edges for them to hold on to and it's more um, resistant to dropping and stuff like that. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. So, I mean, the hardware side, I think you will see at least adaptations. Um, and, and I'm not on the hardware side, so on the software side, I think what we won't see, well, what I'm not pushing for is a future in which kids use very different interfaces than adults, and then when they get older, they don't know how to use the, they have a whole other learning process to learn that. What I, what I think will be the right path in the future is a sort of scaffolded approach. We want everyone to be able to be successful in their interaction. And we need to be able to scaffold um, to eventually be able to use apps the same way that adults do. So the first step of that is understanding what did the kids mean to do. If we don't know what they meant to touch or what gesture they meant to draw, we can't help them get better. So. This is, a, you know, a philosophy coming from my involvement with intelligent tutoring systems. If we can at least understand what they meant by developing these technologies, these layers that can do that, we can then in intervene and scaffold it and say, okay, well, let's try this different A or let's try it in a different way. Sort of slowly falling away the support over time until they are doing it independently. Does that answer your question? Anything, any other questions? I was struck by the non-transferred paper in the algebra learning. Mm -hmm. Although I, I can see other examples of this. Mm. Because they don't have any place to mentally put the, the answer in the mind. Right. And, and this works with adults also. Mm. I guess psychologists love these kinds of things. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I was thinking of the, uh, one of the other ways to look at it to see what was causing that was to do a drag and drop of the, because there isn't too many symbols and people can just drag and put the equation together. Right. And, and put the that would be slower than writing plot. Would that transfer to paper? That's I a good question. That's a really good question, and you know, talk about this in the beginning of my dissertation work. You know, is is handwriting really necessary? 
Um, I think that in a situation with drag and drop, you may still see, it may be less of a, of a cumbersome I interaction than typing, but I, I think you would still see it. I obviously, I haven't I mean, studied just that, like but. The transfer to paper that, that's, mm -hmm. that's a overall conceptual thing about math, but we know that everything is learning specific. Right. And so would they, if they had, if they built not take away that. Yeah, that's that would be really interesting to different ways because that would be a less fraught with recognition errors. That would be um, useful for some psychologists studying. Yeah. Study yeah. Um, the the other uh, the getting on to the um, steps. Mm -hmm. um, it, it occurs to me that we don't need handwriting teachers anymore. If you take what you're doing in a different way and talking about some of the issues that kids have in that they lift their hand off the page mm -hmm. and um, they, they, they don't continue in the same line or in the same uh, form. Right. That there's, that there's probably, you can probably break it down into all sorts of mistakes. And right. And you can give um, training, but you can develop training programs, just like you were doing now. Exactly. The training program. Exactly. They figure away and they show it above, but they still follow the figure and they understand how to do that kind of representation. Right. There are quite a few handwriting apps for the iPad that use that exact model where they give the stu like children a path and it's like a little road and you're dragging the car along the road and it's an eight. Like the road is an eight or the road is a seven. And, you know, those types of things is for really young kids to I, start. I suspected that they, they're there. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I suspect that they don't say, what are the issues that the kid has? Right. What, what is, can we do, like the algebra learning program, right. give them those specific problem sets that we're going to Right, issues? right, right. And what you have when, if you do the, the dollar in, mm -hmm. and you come up with different patterns that they have to match, you remove exactly. those patterns, and you tighten it as they get better and better. So they get, so they still have success, right. but they get better and better mode of control. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so exactly that gets to what I'm saying about scaffolding it, the experience, and, and sort of getting them um, more competent in general, but starting off at a base where we can at least give them some level of success. So, but I think you're right. I personally love to look at tutoring in that way, again, where we're, we're modeling the student's knowledge and we're, we have the technology ready to interpret in order to build on that and improve the, um, the both the skills of the student and the interaction in general. Yeah. I live with a faculty that does pattern recognition all the time around. I mean, and if you're in signal processing and engineering, mm -hmm. you do pattern recognition. Right. And, and I'm not sure if you've looked at a whole bunch of other algorithms just to see if you can get other things out. We have. We, you know, we have looked at different things. Um, I think the, the appeal of the template matcher is that it really uses very simple mathematical calculations to do the matching. Um, other things that might be more opaque, you know, like neural networks or HMMs or hidden markup models are often used for handwriting recognition. And then what you end up with is a little bit, uh, quite a big learning curve to get someone who just wants to do, you know, an app for their child. Um, and, and so we're sort of trying to straddle that line where, I mean, we're, we're not necessarily trying to uh, uh, break the state of the art of uh, recognizers, but we're just, we're trying to get something that's really well, um, that's able to be used really well so that we can show that it works in a variety of contexts and that it's anyone can, that it actually works. Also. Right, it actually <laughs> works. And then anyone can kind of use it and we can sort of see how that, how it's taken up and, and then study that. Thank you. I'm glad you asked to meet with me about I got to go. <laughs> Great. I, I now know where we met before. Right. In, in Canada. Yeah, we met at GI. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Okay. All right. So let's see. Thank you so much. Thank you.